Good afternoon, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. I want to thank you for taking the time here as we've just reached the top of the hour to join myself. This is Logan McCoy speaking, as well as Jacob Tarowski here at CCB Technology. We're going to be reviewing the Microsoft Azure platform and more or less in this sense providing an introduction to what Microsoft Azure is and specifically within that what the backup and recovery options are and are available for nonprofits. So it looks like we have a smaller group today uh, with Chuck and Brad, but what I want to say in that regard is what we'll probably do is still keep you muted for the rest of the duration of this presentation, but potentially at the end of the presentation, uh, we might unmute you just to have more of an open dialogue and discussion. But for the sake of time and uh, to kind of keep out any background noise, we'll keep you muted at this point. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because if you do have questions as I'm going throughout the presentation, please feel free to put those in the Q&A section. Now, within WebEx, there's both the Q&A and the chat portion of things. So I would encourage you just to put those in the Q&A section here, and Jacob will try and answer those throughout or we'll try and answer those at the very end and have more of an actual open discussion and dialogue. So that being said, let's jump right into it. And in doing so, I wanted to give you guys just a quick agenda of what we're going to be talking about today within the next 30 minutes that we have together. First thing I want to do is just provide you with a quick overview of who CCB technology is. Then I want to talk about the Azure nonprofit program and more specifically what the eligibility is around that, what the guidelines are for that, what the details are associated with that program overall. And then I want to go into what the Azure pricing calculator is and how you can utilize it, specifically centered around how to price out a backup and recovery solution within the Azure platform. And then last but certainly not least, I want to run through the Azure Backup and Recovery Solution Set. So I want to run through the benefits, the deployment models, the overall security associated within that, and then as well just a few quick bullet points on what the next steps are to help you get started. So that being said, I mentioned it earlier, but my name is Logan McCoy, and I'm the Vice President of Services here at CCB Technology. I've been with the organization now for just over 10 years. Uh, a majority of that has actually been on the sales side, but about two and a half years ago, I actually moved into the services team and have absolutely loved it. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I have Jacob Tarowski on the phone with me as well, and he's our Director of Services here at CCB Technology and uh, really one of our resident Azure experts that we have in-house. So a little bit about CCB Technology, just who we are and what we do. We were started 26 years ago, and we were founded in Racine, Wisconsin. That's still where our headquarters are located. We have roughly around 60 employees, and in the time of us being in business, we've worked with about 40,000 different clients across the nation. Now, for us, a majority of those actually fall within the nonprofit sector, and the reason for that is because the CEO, Chris Booth, founded the company really with the mission to serve nonprofits by enabling them to procure technology solutions, and initially that was in the software realm, for an affordable price. And so if you've ever taken advantage of the Microsoft Charity Licensing Program or the Adobe Charity Licensing Program or Symantec, the list goes on and on, chances are Chris probably had a hand in creating all of that. And so while we work with a number of different clients that are in all different types of verticals, whether that be corporate or healthcare, manufacturing, educational, really our heart and our mission and, and really the core of what we still do is, is looking to serve the nonprofits that we work with across the nation which has been an absolute delight for me these past 10 years to do so. So we like to say here at TCB that our goal really is to empower the people that we work with, and many of them are in the IT department, to be superheroes within their organization. Now, more specifically, when we started as an organization, we were that traditional box ship type organization. So think something similar like a CDW, if you want to kind of put us in context of that. But where things really started to change for us was about six or seven years ago, the nonprofits that we were serving and working with were really asking the, the question for us of, hey, it's great that you guys are helping us to procure the software and the hardware but we need help implementing these solutions. We really need help implementing as well these new cloud solutions that at the time were coming out. Before it was Office 365, it was Microsoft BPOS, right? And so we were very early to the game in a number of those ways to help implement those solutions for our clients. And since then, our solution offering from a services delivery perspective has really grown where we're not just doing cloud-based Microsoft solutions, though that's still much of what we do with Office 365 and Azure, which we're talking about today, but we do a, a number of different services, whether it's a server implementation and upgrade, it's a firewall replacement, or just reaching out your switching out your core network, putting in an all-new switch stack, whatever it might be, 
to then the ongoing maintenance, we really have been doing for a number of our organizations because of their request to say, we just need help monitoring, managing, supporting this, and implementing these, these new solutions. So down here is just a list of some of the awards that we've won. It shows the ITIL best practices that we follow and some of the key things that we offer to our clients from that services perspective. So that's just a little bit about CCB and a little bit about what we do within the overall services realm. So that being said, though, let's actually jump into the Microsoft Azure nonprofit program. And I want to run through a number of things within all of this because, and there's, I should say there's three key things I want to do. First is just giving you an overview of the program itself, then diving into what is included within that 5,000 spend, and then talking about the Azure services. Because what I want you to walk away with at a foundational level is, first and foremost, what this looks like and how you might be able to take advantage of it, right? So from a program eligibility standpoint, Microsoft would consider you eligible and have the ability to take advantage of these services that they're offering at what they're providing from a discount or a credit in this sense if you are a nonprofit or non-governmental organization that holds a 501c3 charitable status, right? So as the IRS defines it, 501c3, if you have that, that's a huge check that you need to be able to have in order to be approved for this program. Within that as well, you have to be able to operate on a nonprofit basis. You need to have a mission that benefits the broader community, which most of our nonprofits do. So I would say 90% of the time, if you have that 501c3 and you go through the process to submit all this, you're going to get approved. Where there can at times be a bit of a, um, a limitation or a restriction, because Microsoft won't just carte blanche approve you if you have that 501c3, is especially if you fall in the healthcare sector. So if you're an assisted living facility, if you're a hospital, anything of that nature, there are certain restrictions that could potentially put you outside of the program. So while I want to say that, again, if you've got that 501c3, you've got a pretty good shot at being approved, it's not a guarantee. But that's definitely where you want to start. Now, from that standpoint, other things that you just want to consider as we're reviewing the overall program eligibility is how is it determined or who determines it, right? And Microsoft has actually partnered with an organization called TechSoup, and they are the ones that are responsible for validating all nonprofit organizations. And so essentially what that process looks like and how you go about submitting for that eligibility to be approved for it is there's a, there's a website that's very easy to go to. You can go to Bing or Google, whatever you want to. And essentially, if you just type in Microsoft Nonprofit Charity Program, it's going to take you to their home landing page that's going to give you a lot of great information. And one of the very first things they enable you to do is it's a nice little tab that just says Get Started Here. And that's where you would go to submit for your eligibility. And the key thing is this isn't just for Azure. This could also be for Office 365, for volume licensing. It really kind of goes across to all of those. Now, all of that to say, you might be wondering as well, what does it look like from the standpoint of once I've submitted, how long should I wait to hear back? And that's normally around 20 business days is what TechSoup says. But the one thing I want to say, I've seen it actually uh, be a much quicker turnaround. So while they say 20 days, I think that's just to protect themselves. I typically see them returning those responses within about 24 to 48 hours. And you might ask, how long does that eligibility last? And once you've been validated, the answer to that would be your eligibility lasts for a period of two years, right? Now, looking at the next bullet point, the Azure credit and that $5,000 spend, right? So the basic gist of it is, if you're approved in that eligibility program to have that nonprofit credit received here, what you will get as a nonprofit organization is up to $5,000 in Azure credit spend on an annual basis. Now, a key thing, and this is typically the next question that we get from clients, is so what happens if I exceed that $5,000? Like I move all, not this, let's just not talk about backup and recovery, but I move all of my infrastructure services into Azure, and I know I'm going to exceed that $5,000. What happens? Well, Microsoft essentially, when they go to set you up and you set up your Azure portal, one of the things that you're going to put in there is a credit card. Now, they don't bill that credit card right away, but essentially what they do is they have that on file because if at a point you do exceed that $5,000 spend that you get on an annual basis, it immediately converts it to a pay-as-you-go pay type of offering, which just means that you're only paying for what you're consuming, but because you've already used the $5,000 spend, you would now be paying whatever is a additional above that. Now, other questions I often get in that regard is, you know, can I split that up over a number of 12 months? You know, basically, could I do 1,000 here and 5,000 here just in one month? And the answer is um, no. Um, it's basically you can use that $5,000 at your discretion over a 12-month period. So you kind of have that answer there for you. 
Another question we often get is, so let's say I don't use all of my Azure spend. So I've got that 5,000 and I only use 3,000, so technically I have 2,000. Does that carry over to the next year? And the answer is no. What happens essentially once that annual year comes up is that it just totally resets and you start with a brand new $5,000 credit spend for that next annual year that you have there. Another question I often will get at times is, so does this credit also cover taxes? So not just the services, but the taxes for that? And the answer to that is yes. So the next question that I often get is, so let's say I already have an Azure portal. Can I merge my current subscription with this new one because this nonprofit program didn't always exist? So we have had nonprofit organizations who they actually had a corporate Azure portal enabled that they were already utilizing, and then this program came out and they wanted to take advantage of it. So the answer to that is, yes, you can merge some subscriptions. You can't merge all subscriptions. So let's say, for example, you did this via an EA, like an enterprise agreement, or you did this via the CSP solution or the cloud solution provider, those cannot be merged. But for any that maybe you did it direct with Microsoft, for example, that could be merged into this subscription so that then that starts to kind of come into one so you're not having to manage multiple portals. So the answer is yes, but it just depends on what subscription you're currently utilizing within the Azure portal. Portal. Now, a, a big question that we always get is, so what can I use within the Azure ecosystem against this $5,000 credit? And the great thing is that really you can use whatever you want. So if it's in the Azure platform, whether that be consuming from a VM perspective by spinning up 5, 10 VMs and essentially running your virtual environment in Azure, whether that's doing backup and recovery, whether that's web hosting, SQL DB, whatever it might be, if it's in there, you have the ability as a nonprofit to take advantage of those services and utilize it. And another question that we often get is, so let's say that I work for an organization that has employees in sensitive um, countries, or I work and we aren't allowed to have any of our data reside in this specific country for any reason. Can I choose where my data is being hosted? And the answer is yes. You can actually go in and select not just what country, but specifically what region you want that data to be hosted in. So like for example, you could choose to host it in the central U.S. region, and then from there you know that could either be hosted within Chicago, Iowa, or Texas, for example, is a few of the locations where they currently have data centers out right now. Now, another question that I've got gotten asked quite often is, is there any kind of support that Microsoft includes? And Microsoft does include their developer support within these Azure subscriptions for you as a nonprofit. But the big thing that I would say there is most of our clients are running mission critical type applications in Azure. And so if something goes down, the response time that you're guaranteed from Microsoft isn't really what most clients need from that perspective. And so because of that, I often say that either you should look to partner with an organization like CCB to provide that type of, I would say, 24 by 7 monitoring and management, or look to just, I would say, procure a better Microsoft support contract directly with Microsoft. Because outside of that, you're just at the whim of them getting back to you essentially when they can. And, and for mission critical applications, you just can't live with that, right? Now, the other big question that I always get is, okay, that's great. $5,000 is what I get every single year. How do I calculate what I think I'm going to estimate to use on a monthly basis? And the truth of the matter is Microsoft tries to simplify this as much as they can, but they do a horrible job with it. <laughs> they just do. Um, and, and so what I've got here is the best slide that I was able to find when we talk about just backup and recovery. So obviously you can run a number of different things within Azure, and, and that can't be put on one page or probably even within one PowerPoint without it being enormously large. So what I've basically distilled down here is just from an Azure backup and recovery standpoint. And a clear designation is this is not pertaining to site recovery necessarily. This is just Azure backup and recovery, right? So essentially how they break that down is if you look at the top right, you're going to see that they first break it down by per instance. And that's basically going to be denoted by if it's a virtual machine, a physical server, or let's say a desktop or laptop, right? So there's a cost per instance. And that cost gets tiered based on the amount of storage. So if that instance is less than 50 gigs, for example, it's $5 per month. If it's between 51 to 500 gigs, it's $10 per month. And then for really large instances, so you're essentially paying $10 for every 500 gigs, for example. Now, the other thing that determines cost is you're paying that per instance, but then you're also paying for each gig of storage. And that is broken down into the two categories you see in the gray there, where LRS, or locally redundant storage, 
which would basically mean that it's being that data is being housed in multiple physical servers but all located within the same data center as compared to GRS or globally redundant which you can see the price is more but the benefit there is it's actually your data is being hosted in multiple data centers so you're not just having to essentially rely on that being hosted within one data center but across multiple data centers right and that does again like I noted change the price based on whether you go with LRS or GRS now that being said what you're not paying for are any of the restores, outbound bandwidth, or storage transactions. But like I said, Microsoft really loves to say, yeah, we've made this simple and easy, and look at what this pricing is, and it's, it's still confusing. Even for us as at partners at times, to be honest with you, how Microsoft prices out Azure can be very confusing. So one of the things I thought could be the most helpful to do, and if I close out of this presentation here, and pull up the screen is to show you how you could actually go in and very quickly at least get a, a pretty accurate estimate of what it looks like to price out what the backup and recovery solution would be for you if you're looking to do something like that. So essentially all you do is you could just type in azure.microsoft.com, click on pricing, and then click on the pricing calculator. You do all of that, that pulls you up to this page right here, which is where I'm at right now. The next thing you'd want to do is just go in and click on Add Items. And it's going to pull up all this nice little list right here. And what I'm next going to want to click on is Storage. Now, Storage is going to give me a few options all listed within right here. And you're going to see what those are outlined right here. But what you're going to want to click on is Backup, because obviously that's what we're talking about for today. It's going to let me know that the backup has been added and that I can view the assessment, or view the estimate, I mean. And so I close that out, and this is where I can actually now start to build out what I'm going to estimate my cost to be from a backup standpoint. So again, like I noted, you can pick which region you want your data to be hosted in, and you can see all the varying locations that you have right here. But like I mentioned, Central U.S. region, that's where CCB is located. We'd like our data to be located there as well. Now, just well, I'll do a, an easy example and then break that out a little bit more um, just so you can kind of get an idea of that. But let's say you're looking to back up just one server or one VM, and that one VM has 250 gigs. So you're going to see as I build out that calculator, immediately what it's telling me is that it's $10 per month for that instance. Because remember, between 50 and 500 gigs, you're paying $10 for that instance. And then what I'm paying, because I have this as an LRS, remember that's locally redundant, I could also choose to go GRS, and I'll show you that pricing in a second. But if I have the 250 gigs set up on the LRS pricing, then I'm paying $6 from a storage perspective. If I switch that to GRS, it's essentially going to double it, and I'm paying $12 per month. So all total, when you take into that account that one VM, I'm paying for that instance and that storage across a globally redundant uh, backup across multiple DCs, $22 per month. So again, if you've got that $5,000 spend, you're going to be more than fine and covered in that. But for a lot of our clients, let's say, for example, they have five VMs that they're looking to back up, and each one of those has a terabyte first. So we can actually switch it here from gigabyte to terabyte. So you can see here it obviously ups the cost for the instance. I have five of those instances, and because they're over that 500 gigs, remember I'm paying that $10 for each 500 gigs that's on there. I'm doing this via a globally redundant. Again, if I drop it to LRS, it's gonna drop the price down pretty heavily. And so you can see here, taking these two together, I'm getting that 395. Now, if you're wondering, so what is the monthly amount that I could reach to as a max so that I still fall under the 5,000? And that's around $415 per month. So you'd see here as one example, you could have up to five uh, instances as VMs or physical servers, whatever they might be, and you can have that up to one terabyte for each one of those instances, and you're going to fall below that 415 that you would be on a monthly basis, so you wouldn't exceed that $5,000 credit as an example. So again, if you want to come out here and kind of play with what pricing is going to look like, you just go to azure.microsoft.com, go to pricing, and then from there click on the pricing calculator. It'll pull this up and you can run with it right from there. But I do just want to make a quick note of that as well, that if you have any questions on it, because it's, it's just confusing, there's no nice way to put it, please reach out to either myself or Nick Lepore or Jacob Tarowski. We're more than happy to help in that regard to, to kind of help flesh out what the estimated cost would be, whether it be for backup and recovery or for compute uses, for website hosting, whatever it might be in that regard.
Now moving on to the actual Microsoft Azure backup solution, right? And, and why would you want to consider this? And essentially Microsoft breaks it down into three categories. The first is that it's providing that reliable offsite data protection, right? It's convenient, it's safe, and it's encrypted. And I'm going to get into the security portion a little bit later actually to just touch on that. Another key component is that it provides a simple and integrated solution. It gives you that familiar interface, especially if you know the, the Windows Server environment. It has that Azure integration built in both for the on-prem and pushing to Azure as the off-prem. And it also just provides an overall efficient backup recovery model, right? So it's an efficient, efficient use of that bandwidth and storage. It's very flexible depending on which deployment model you go with. It's very flexible in its recovery. And then it's also, especially for you as a nonprofit, it's cost effective. And because it's that metered usage, you're again only paying for what you're using for and can really, I would say, narrow down to the penny what your cost is going to be on a monthly basis so that you can plan for that on that annual spend that you're getting again for that $5,000. So what do those backup solutions look like? Well, really they're broken down by Microsoft into three categories. So one is the Azure Backup Agent, which uses the MARS, or the Microsoft Azure Recovery Services Agent. And that essentially gets put on each machine. So it could be a server or an endpoint, so like a desktop or a laptop. Now the key thing for that is that this is only used for files and folders. So if you're looking to do a, you know, a VM level backup or a, a bare metal restore, anything of that nature that goes beyond files and folders, this is not your solution for you. As well as if you're looking to customize, you know, your backup policy or how many backup policies you want to have on a specific server, there's limitations within the Mars agent. But the benefit here is the ease of implementation, the ease of use and ongoing management is very, very nice. So if you're just looking to basically say, hey, I just want to make sure that my data is off-site, that it's backed up, that I can get to it at some point if I need to, this is a very good entry-level point to get into. Now beyond that is the Azure Backup Server, and this is what utilizes, I would say, that central management component found within System Center called DPM, or Data Protection Manager. And I'll get into a little bit more of what that looks like, but this is really much more robust in giving you the ability of what you can back up, right? So if you're looking to back up, whether it's Hyper-V or VMware VMs, whether it's SQL Exchange, SharePoint, as applications, those types of things, this is really then the solution set that you're looking to go for. Now a key component of that, and I think it gets touched on in the next slide as well, but I'll just uh, allude to it now, is that while the Azure consumption is going to be included in that 5,000 credit, if you go this route, you would need to procure, if you don't already have, the system center licensing, which is what's included or found within the DPM. And the reason why I bring that up is because that would need to be procured under the volume licensing side of the house, which is still going to have a nonprofit pricing associated with it. But I say that only because that's not found within that $5,000 and it's something to plan for if you don't already have that licensing. Now the last component is the Azure VM backup. That being said, it's going to be very similar to the Azure Backup Server. It's more or less that you're just utilizing Azure as a full component in that regard. So like it says, the management is done in the Azure portal. You back up the Azure via the infrastructure as a service VMs. So your compute usage in Azure is going to be much higher, but you're not having to pay for that licensing cost and, and basically use the on-prem licensing of System Center DPN to function within all of that. So filling these out a little bit more, and in doing that, let's actually start at the bottom. So like I started first when it was on the left side in the last slide there, Microsoft Azure Backup of the Mars agent, right? There's no on-premise storage needed. There's no additional infrastructure needed. It's only that file and folder. So again, it's not going to back up VM level. Windows Server does require internet connectivity at all times. It does have that self-service backup and recovery. And this is a key one as well. And this is where I'm saying it's a really great entry level. It only gives you a maximum backup of three times a day, and you can only apply a single backup policy per server. So again, if you're looking to have additional configuration beyond that, this might not be the right fit for you. However, if you're just looking to be able to have some type of backup that's pushing your data offsite and is backing up to three times a day, this could be a really great fit for you. Now the next one up, and if we just jump to the very top then, that System Center DPM, that's again where I was talking about you have that on-prem server with System Center DPM that's essentially backing that data up locally and on your on-premise location and then also pushing that up to Azure as needed, right? So a nice benefit there is that only the System Center DPM server needs internet connectivity. Another major benefit is obviously the workload backup. So again, it's going beyond the file and folder and now enabling you to do everything from an actual application as well as a VM side, right?
But again, remember, you'd have to buy the System Center licensing if you don't already have that. So just a few key components there. And then the last one, and I'm just not going through all of these for the sake of time, but this is going to be very similar, as it says here, to the System Center DPM option, except that you do not have to have System Center running locally. All of those services would essentially be run in Azure, but it does require an Azure subscription to always essentially be up and running. And you're going to have that pay-as-you-go model for that compute usage, again, now that you're utilizing from those Azure infrastructure as a service VMs that are happening at that level. Now, I had mentioned earlier touching on backup security. And OK, so my data is being pushed into Azure. What does that security look like in transit and at rest? And this is a great little slide that just shows you what essentially Microsoft does when they're pushing that data. And again, this is high level, so take it for what it's worth in that regard. But more or less what it's doing is it's compressing that data, it's encrypting that data, where it's putting a 256-bit encryption on it, both in transit and at rest, and pushing that to Azure, where it's backed up and encrypted and in the backup vault. Now, what's interesting about this as well is that with that encryption, you're provided as the admin or whoever that might be within your organization, the, the keys that essentially allow you to decrypt that, right? And here's a key component that Microsoft likes to tout. You are the only one that has that key. Data cannot be recovered without that key, standard when you're trying to decrypt something, right? But a key thing is Microsoft does not have your key. So if for whatever reason that key is lost, that data cannot be uh, decrypted. It cannot be unencrypted. So it remains encrypted while stored, and it remains encrypted on the network. And again, only you have the key, which is a great benefit from that perspective from a security standpoint, but also places a lot of responsibility and onus on you as a user to make sure you store that key in a place where you know you're going to be able to retrieve it if needed. So last but not least, because I know we're getting to the end of our time here, and I, I want to make sure that I leave maybe just a few minutes for questions, is how do I get started within all of this? What does this look like? Well, one of the first things you'd want to do is, if you are a nonprofit, to go to that Microsoft nonprofit charity program. Just type that into Google or Bing, and it'll pull up the primary website that you'll want to go to. And if you find within there just the Getting Started tab, it's going to give you exactly what you need to, go, to do to go ahead and get submitted for that process. And it runs it through you very relatively seamlessly what you need to do. Once you've done that, then you want to go in and get an Azure subscription. Right, and from there, you go in and actually you would set up a recovery services vault. And a keynote I want to make here within this as well is that primarily when they're going through these step-by-steps, that's really if you're going to be performing the the first backup option that we talked about, which is that Mars agent backup. Some of this is going to change quite drastically if you start doing things where you're utilizing the System Center DPM or the Azure infrastructure as a service VMs to kind of help supplement that and go beyond just the file and folder backup type. But if you're just wanting to do that to get started, to kind of get your dip your toes in this and feel like what this is going to look like, um, you would create that recovery services vault once that subscription is created download the necessary files, which would also then be installing the recovery services agent or the Mars agent as we call it. There are very easy prompts to run through once that's installed, um, so much so that I was, I mean, it took me a matter of maybe 30 minutes to do this on my own system here, and then push out that backup policy, which is then all housed. You can, meaning from an interface standpoint, very easily integrate with that Mars. Um, agents so that you can recover those files as needed, whether that be a full recovery or a, you know, a partial recovery as needed. But essentially, that's what it looks like from a bullet point standpoint for you to, uh, to start this process of getting uh, everything running with Azure Backup. So that being said, I see that we've got a few questions here that, that were asked, but I believe that Jacob's actually already answered them. So are there any other questions uh, that any of you might have? And you can either touch. We've had a few more people actually join, so I think I'll keep you muted at this point. But if you want to, maybe chat a question in or yeah, put a question in the Q&A section. We, uh, Jacob or I would be happy to answer that. And as well, if you have any additional questions that come up or you even just want to see more of a deep dive demo, uh, we really wanted to give a high overview here, but we're more than happy to show you what the Azure portal looks like to run through, you know, what it, it takes to set this up from the Mars agent especially because it's relatively quick. We'd, we'd be more than happy to do that. 
The other thing as well that I just did just want to make note of for each of you guys to be aware of is that on our end, we, we do this day in and day out. And so if this is something where you know you want to do, but maybe you don't feel comfortable doing yourself or you'd like some support on, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because, again, we do these day in and day out and would be happy and would consider it you know, a privilege to be able to support you in this regard to help implement a effective backup solution both on-prem and off-prem for your organization. But that being said, I want to thank each of you guys for taking the time to join us today. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Jacob. We will be sending out this recording after the fact, um, probably within the next few days once our marketing team gets to spruce it, spruce it up just a little bit, and we will go from there. So again, thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of the day, and hopefully we uh, get the opportunity to talk with each of you sometime in the near future. Thank you.